Active Claremont, thanks for joining us tonight. We're really excited uh, to have our presenter. Uh, before we get to them in just a moment, I do have just a couple of announcements, very, very brief. Be sure to check your emails. Uh, next month, we're planning on having a uh, town hall forum with the school board candidates. It's going to be a little different than we're used to using. Uh, they're used to presenting uh, in person, obviously. We're going to try to use this format. Um, and uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'll get uh, get you in, in chat. You guys can hear me okay? See me okay? No problem. Anyways, so regarding the school board candidates, check your email. We have a form that went out to ask questions. We want to see as many people uh, fill out the form if you have a question ahead of time as possible. Uh, that way we can get those questions compiled and ask these uh, candidates those questions and kind of consolidate any that are similar. Uh, so be sure to check your emails uh, for that. Now, enough of the – that I said announcements. There's one. Um, other than that, I think we are good. Thank you. Perfect, Alexander. Thank you very much. Good to see you. And we now have our presenters. I'll go ahead and – lower my screen here because you don't want to see me anyway so we have justine and victoria from the benton museum of art at pomona college and that's formerly the pomona college museum of art is that correct correct perfect okay very good uh so uh, uh if you're unfamiliar with the benton museum of art hopefully this meeting is for you uh, if you were unaware of the goings-on at Pomona College, hopefully you learned something here tonight. Uh, so could you go ahead and start us off, maybe introduce yourselves, and let us know a little bit about your work with the museum? Sure, Justine, why don't you start? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having us. My name is Justine Bay Bias, and um, I am the Communication and Engagement a manager at the Benton Museum of Art, as Matt said, formerly known as Pomona College Museum of Art. And I've been here for about nine years, going into my ninth year. Wow. So hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. We are delighted to be with all of you. And of course, really counting down the days until we can welcome you inside our museum. Today, we are just delighted to share some updates, some background. My name is Victoria Sancho Lobis. I am the Sarah Rempel and Herbert S. Rempel Class of 23 Director of the Museum and Associate Professor of Art History at Pomona College. I just started at Pomona in January of this year. It's been quite an interesting year so far. Um, moving into our new building, preparing to open, and doing all of that now with the backdrop of a global pandemic. So um, this is a, it's a memorable time, and we're glad to, to be with you and look forward to welcoming you inside our space. I have um, prepared just a few slides, um, but I know that this is an informal session. We're happy to take questions. I'm sure quite a number of you may have a history with our um, museum that has um, existed in previous incarnations going back over a century. Pomona College has had um, a, a gallery space or museum space, and it's been my pleasure to really study that history as I've um, been getting acclimated to this new role. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and do you, Victoria, do you want to move into your presentation? It doesn't look sure. like you have any questions now. Uh, but yes, if you do have any questions, uh, absolutely ask them in chat. We'll get to them. Um, those of you that have watched our previous streams uh, know that uh, we are fairly informal with the questions. Um, so as long as uh, I can see them coming in and they're relevant to the topic that we're on. I'll also obviously moderate a little bit. If uh, th there's a slide coming up that, that addresses your question, we will get to it somewhere either immediately or later on in the presentation. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go ahead and see your presentation, Victoria. Take it away. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, it was really fun to put together some images. I um, wanted to share a little background about me. So like I said, I started in January of this year 
and um, I am somewhat familiar with Claremont. I, my partner is a professor at Claremont McKenna College and has been teaching there for about 12 years. And in that time, I've kind of come in and out of Claremont. This is actually the first time that I've lived and worked full time in Claremont. Before being employed by Pomona College, I worked for the Art Institute of Chicago uh, for six years in a number of different roles and um, was able to focus in my primary area of specialization as a curator there in the Department of Prints and Drawings. So my primary area of research is 17th century art and specifically 17th century works on paper. These are my two books um, that are exhibition catalogs we did at the Art Institute. I like to say after my husband, Peter Paul Rubens is the great love of my life. So um, maybe some of you share those feelings. Um, but in addition to 17th century Dutch and Flemish art, I've worked across a number of different areas. I have um, can't seem to get away from James McNeil Whistler, done a number of projects related to his prints specifically, um, and also had the pleasure of working on a Mexican print show at the Art Institute, the um, Taller de Grafica Popular um, workshop, exhibition that we did soon after I arrived and also have worked with some contemporary artists. So the um, slide on my far right is a drawing by an artist named Colleen Smith, um, who is now a professor at Cal Arts. We met in Chicago and we both relocated here to Southern California. And she and I just um, completed another project, an exhibition of a film that she commissioned in, that she was commissioned to make in response to the wonderful um, Sanchez Cotan still life in the San Diego Museum of Art collection. So that is on view just as soon as they reopen. And um, we hope to collaborate with Colleen at the Benton Museum of Art as well. So that's a little bit about me. I am very committed to Latin American art and um, was so delighted to join Pomona, not least because, of course, our um, Jose Clemente Orozco mural is one of the, you know, events that really launched Pomona's engagement with commissioning contemporary art and collecting art. Um, and that was already 90 years ago. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. So it has been a great joy to come on board just as the college has completed its new building. This is our Bonita Plaza entrance that you see here. Um, the building was designed by Boston-based architects Machado Silvetti together with Gensler, a local architect here in the greater Los Angeles area. And as you can see, it um, you know really uses a lot of right angles, very strong horizontal profile, and this, I think, very elegant and, and beautiful combination of these poured in place concrete bricks, which you see on the left hand side, um, as well as this red cedar accenting that creates the portico here at our Bonita Plaza entrance. Yeah. One of the fun elements, you can kind of look all the way through the building. You see in the middle of this slide, we call that the art hall, and I'll take you inside there in a moment. Um, but one of the things I love about this building is the way that I think it really manifests our mission and our values. And so one thing that you already see here is the idea of transparency. And mm -hmm. so important for a college art museum to be really transparent about its activities, um, its, its um, you know, how it expresses its mission, and in our case, our commitment to really engaging our campus community and taking that work um, beyond the, the campus to really share with our resident communities as well. Sure. So we have that idea of transparency here and accessibility. There's uh, many different ways to enter our museum. Here is one. Um, and I just wanna show you, for those of you who may be familiar with our previous incarnation. Um, as Matt said, the Pomona College Museum of Art is um, our most previous incarnation. We've had a number of different names over the years, 
Pomona College Museum of Art was located in the Montgomery Art Center, which was constructed in 1956 and then renovated a couple of times after that. Um, but this graphic just shows you, you know, what a big change this is for us going um, from about, you know, just under 11,000 square feet to over 33,000 square feet. Um, we've increased our gallery space, our storage space. We've added two classrooms. I'll show you one of those. Um, we have much greater capacity and um, many times more bathrooms. We, we love to celebrate how many more bathrooms we have and finally a loading dock as well. Oh, so right. um, just kind of takes us to another level of operation. And we're really excited to start installing art in the building and fully inhabiting it. I couldn't resist showing a nighttime slide since we're getting together here at 7.15 p.m. Um, and so then here is the, the entrance. This is our Fletcher Jones Foundation foyer. And you see some of those same materials. We have all different treatments of concrete, um, which is such a beautiful material. The terrazzo flooring, the smooth finished concrete, and again, those red cedar accents. Um, so when you come in, we can't show you yet, but the, um, the wall opposite the entrance doors will have a site-specific commission from an artist, Alia Ali, who we are working with in our inaugural season. Here's a look down that art hall I mentioned. Some of you may already have visited our courtyard, the John and Louise Bryson courtyard, which you see just to the left. Um, here is a little peek inside the galleries, which have um, really wonderful capacious ceiling height um, capability for audio, visual. Um, my associate director registrar, some of you may know Steve Kamba, told me that they um, designed the building so that we could suspend a pickup truck from the ceiling <laughs> just in case, you know, contemporary artists wanted to make a work that uh, weighed that much. So we're, we like to think we're prepared for almost any kind of art installation we would want to do. Um, so over the last year, a lot of our time was spent moving from our previous location into the new building. That was really the big project of this year. The new building was completed in 2019 and, and it's really taken um, up until just now to finally get everything um, consolidated under one roof. Our collections, uh, which number approximately 15,000 objects were dispersed across campus and in offsite storage. We just didn't have enough storage space. So we we're delighted to move everything over. And of course, some of the most dramatic moves of the collection were um, related to the outdoor sculpture. So here you see um, on the left are Peter Shelton, Pomona class of 73 sculpture, Gandhi G um, being put in place. And then our Chris Burden, another Pomona alum, um, that, that sculpture, the yellow and black sculpture, also it's untitled, um, being moved into the Star family sculpture patio. So those are the more dramatic ones. The, the less exciting um, uh, moves are, you know, lots of objects and boxes coming, coming across <laughs> in um, various phases. We were also so excited, and this is something that you can see today, um, so excited just in April of this year to install our new commissioned sculpture. This is a cast bronze sculpture by uh, Southern California-based artist, Allison Saar. Some of you may be familiar with um, other members of her family, very artistic family. It seems like you, you, if you're in the Saar family, you have to be a visual artist, her father is a ceramicist. Her mother, Betty Sarr, has just been celebrated with major exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art New York and also here at LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So Allison attend attended Scripps College and uh, we were delighted to have the opportunity to commission this sculpture from her on the occasion of our new building. And it is in place and everyone is, is welcome to come to our courtyard and see it. And these times when we can't be fully open, it's really um, uplifting to know that we are still able to share our outdoor sculpture collection. And so this sure. is a brand new addition. Wonderful. One question here, me uh, going back to the size of the new space, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, we have uh, Alexandra has a question, maybe a silly question, but how many works of art can be presented there and maybe compared to uh, the old space? It would really depend on the type of artwork um, that would be shown. So our collection, and in fact, we're preparing in this inaugural season of exhibitions to show monumental sculpture by Alison Sarr, you know, 12 feet tall, and also a collection of snuff bottles that are maybe just three or four inches. So it, it really depends on um, what we, we would be showing in terms of the, n- the number of works. Um, it is roughly three times the, the gallery space. So that's um, exciting, an exciting yeah. change for us. Definitely. Another question, and I think it's referring to uh, in the lobby, uh, there's a piece, there's a structure uh, in the lobby at the top. Um, Somebody is asking about that, is, mm-hmm. if, if that's a, a, a piece or just part that's of That's an architectural feature. That is just, it's a kind of articulated light well. Um, so all around it, there is um, natural light coming in and it's... Um, it's basically just an architectural feature to um, make our entrance lobby, you know, that much more dramatic. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I, I do like the, the I know it's uh, poured in place concrete with the wood accents. I think it looks, mm-hmm. it's a very cool look. Thank you. Yeah, I think the architects wanted to find a way to have some you know, sympathy or resonance with so many of the Spanish tile roofs that we have. And if you see, um, I don't know if any of my images really show this very well. Um, You can see a little bit here, maybe, you know, there's a slight pitching of the roof and um, they wanted to have some way to echo, you know, the generally, you know, low, um, low, you know, height buildings across our campus at Pomona, but also across the the city of Claremont. Um, so, yeah, we're really pleased with how they found a way to integrate, you know, this new architecture within a vocabulary that makes sense in Southern California. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we have any other questions right now. But again, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them in chat at any time and we will address them uh, as it comes up. And uh, hopefully also uh, your question will be answered in the presentation itself. So I'll just, you know, keep giving some sense of of what's been going on and what we have to look forward to. Um, As I mentioned, this is a brand new installation We're just so delighted that um, the artist, again, Alison Saar, who is a Pasadena resident currently, grew up in Pasadena, attended Scripps and and stayed local here in Southern California. Um, It's just, it's such a great opportunity to commission a work when the artist can get to know the site specifically and also the scale of the building. So the very specific placement of the sculpture its height, its color, all of those elements are, um, you know, designed specifically for our institution and our site. And in fact, the what you see here is um, a representation or an evocation of the Yoruba goddess um, Yamaya, who is a water deity. So you see her um, with these water vessels uh, on her head and then pouring out this bucket of water. And you see these natural grasses around the sculpture. I think this is maybe before we kind of finish the the whole installation. We still haven't put the official title plaque next to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but Allison did some research related to our specific location in Claremont and the river basin um, that we all occupy. And so this is a specific reference to, um, you could say kind of geological history or ecological history again, of our specific site. So um, unlike some of our other outdoor um, sculptures that we you know, acquired and installed, um, this is a work that was made specifically with this location in mind, um, meaning the city of Claremont and our building um, site specifically. So it, I um, have to give credit to my predecessor, Kathleen Stewart Howe, who really initiated this project and you see a long list of um, donors and and those who left um, endowed funds with us to support this kind of activity. So it really 
um, took the generosity of many and the the will of our um, colleagues and certainly my predecessor, Kathleen Stewart Howe, to, to bring this together. And it's really exciting because it's also um, carried out in a moment where we are preparing to install our inaugural season of exhibitions, which will also include um, a major monographic exhibition of the same artist, Alison Saar. So this is a project that we are um, realizing together with the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena. So it's a single exhibition that has two venues. And we hope that everyone will enjoy you know, visiting our space, going to Pasadena and visiting the Armory Center for the Arts. Um, this fall, the Scripps uh, Williamson Gallery is planning to present a selection of prints by Alison Saar. So we're really delighted that that we're part of a, you know, kind of LA wide effort to celebrate this artist and the catalog that we've just published is a major contribution to scholarship on um, Alison Saar's work. So we're just thrilled that our commission um, is also kind of reinforced by this big loan exhibition that will inaugurate our first season um, together with a couple of other, um, other exhibitions, in fact, five other exhibitions. So six exhibitions uh, total that we are now in the process of presenting. So um, two other monographic works, so they're, uh, sorry, monographic projects. So there are three monographic projects featuring women artists of different, um, different generations and um, different ethnic backgrounds. So we are doing another installation work uh, with artist Helen Pashkian, who is also a graduate of Pomona College. She was a member of the light and space movement together with artists like James Terrell. Um, and there's this is an installation completely shrouded in mystery. So we know what it is and what it will look like, but we have all been sworn to secrecy. Oh. So I'm <laughs> showing you a, a work um, that um, Helen Pashkian made that is in our permanent collection just to give you some sense of her manipulation of light and color. And that is about cool. all we can say because <laughs> she really wants the experience of seeing her installation to be um, completely unfiltered by any prior knowledge. So that's that's all we can say about that. Um, but we can tell you that we're also doing uh, another exhibition in our project series. Uh, project series began in the 1990s. My colleague, Rebecca McGrew, our senior curator, initiated the project series, which is just a wonderful venue for emerging artists to have a monographic exhibition of their work and to have a publication dedicated to their work. And in many cases for these artists, this is you know, the first time they're having a museum show, the first time they're having a museum publication. Alia Ali is the artist we are featuring in our project series number 53. Um, and this is an example of her work um, that, that um, is representative of, of her style. So she likes to um, incorporate a lot of textiles. And here you see her kind of signature um, work to date often involves um, these, you know, figures, human figures completely wrapped in textiles and then photographed against a, a textile background. Um, so that gives you some flavor of Alia's work. And then before I um, say a little bit about the other exhibitions that we're doing, I just wanted to bring you, I guess, kind of even deeper inside the museum. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, we're so pleased our gallery space has expanded, but we also really expanded our ability to provide access to our permanent collection. We created two, um, we call them either classrooms or portals. So these are effectively study rooms that can operate as, you know, fully kitted out classrooms, either for teaching college classes or having um, informal study sessions. 
Um, so here you see the Michael Madison, Judy Hochberg works on paper study room. Um, you can see that we're projecting um, using our document camera. Um, so if you place something in the middle of the table, you can turn on a camera and then everyone can see something enlarged on the screen um, just Very for cool. ease of discussion. Yeah. And um, so we're really excited to make our collections more accessible, not just in our galleries, but also in our classrooms and also in our on-site storage. Yeah. Now, one question about the classroom sections that somebody actually has, too, is uh, could that be used by the general public, basically, mm -hmm. other people within the city? Uh, and then also, um, it, it, is there maybe not in the classroom so much, but uh, is there a, a way to have a group reserve a room like this or, you know, have the museum host a group from the mm -hmm. public? So the, I mean, our collections, our permanent collections are, you know, open to the public by appointment. So we, um, you know, a number of us are trained and prepared to receive visitors to, um, you know, see our collection, depending on what the object is, you would either see it in one of our study rooms. We also have a study room dedicated to our Native American art collection, which numbers approximately 6,000 objects. Um, so it, yeah, it just depends on, it, you know, if it's a research, um, visit or if it's an informal group who just wants to see some of our Goya prints or some of the photographs we recently received documenting the different arenas of World War II. Um, yeah, our, our general policy is that we are open to the public and happy to accommodate those visits as much as possible. Um, these classrooms are in some cases, you know, will be used for regularly meeting classes. Right. And, you know, we just have to, to work around those schedules. Uh, we also have an event space, our Loeb Family Art Pavilion. Um, and that is a, a space that's kind of like a non-art space. And um, through the Pomona College Events Department, that space can also be reserved um, for a fee related, just independent of the, the life of the museum. So sure. one of the things I love about our building is these kind of different levels of intimacy and access and, you know, just kind of really depends on what the, the purpose of the visit or the purpose of the event would be. Absolutely. Uh, another question here uh, related to the classrooms is also uh, talking about uh, opportunities maybe for area high school students too, mm -hmm. or will it just uh, plans for just the college students? Yes, we have been participating in the Art Start program, and Justine may be able to um, say a little bit more about that. We, um, one of the exhibitions I'll mention in a minute that we're developing from our permanent collections relates to um, photographic representations on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. And we are very specifically designing some K-12 through programming related to that exhibition. We have a student um, who's basically her fall work study job will be to help us develop um, some K through 12 um, educational opportunities. And so we hope to hear from more members of the community, um, our resident communities, you know, inland and um, in Claremont specifically, but also other inland cities about how we can, um, you know, more robustly engage um, K through 12 groups and, and other groups as well. But Justine, you may want to add something about our outreach. Yes, um, thanks, Victoria. Uh, as she mentioned, our Art Start, the Art Start program that the Claremont Museum of Art hosts, um, we work with uh, art educator Rich Dealey and have been working with Claremont Unified School Districts High School, um, as well as the college students at the Claremont colleges and the elementary schools in Claremont Unified. Um, we have some other uh, education outreach programs. If you're interested in learning more, um, the best way to see sort of the things that we're doing programmatically is to follow us on social media. Uh, our hashtag and our handle for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is at Benton at Pomona. And actually, I'm also chatting. All right. <laughs> in here. So I just posted that in the YouTube. Perfect. Chat link. Um, 
But uh, we do a lot of engagement through um, a program that we regularly have called Art After Hours. And we used to stay open every Thursday from 5 to 11 p.m. Um, so that community members, K through 12 students and families, other groups can come and enjoy the museum after hours. Um, currently, because of the pandemic, we are closed to our students as well as the public, but right. we're hoping to reinvigorate that in a new way in this new space, in this new location, um, incorporating not just K through 12 public, but all of you. Excellent. Wonderful. I think that uh, I didn't mean to derail, although there is a comment. Uh, Alexandra really enjoys the art that you're sharing with us. Oh, good. Well, let's do some more art, Alexandra. Here's some more art. So, um, and I may be coming to the end of my slides. I, I'm not sure how many more we have, but um, I wanted to at least indicate the three other exhibitions that we are preparing for our inaugural season. And as Justine mentioned, um, you know, we are aiming to open in early 2021 our you know, Pomona College students are currently enrolled in classes run entirely online. So we want to celebrate the opening of our museum um, when Pomona College students can be with us in person to um, to help, you know, celebrate that, that occasion. And the exhibitions that I'm describing, we plan to run through the end of May, 2021. So, we are in the process of installing them now and um, look forward to having them on view through May of next year. Great. So they will include, in addition to the three monographic exhibitions that I mentioned, um, so our kind of marquee exhibition is the Allison Sar project. We're also doing this project series show, which is a four part exhibition with Alia Ali, one part of which is actually exclusively online. So she, in some ways, was anticipating <laughs> the moment that we would be in that was planned um, from the beginning to be wow. that way. Um, then this um, intentionally quite mysterious installation conceived by Helen Pashkian, and then three permanent collection exhibitions. And I'm just showing a single work kind of representing each one. Um, so I'll go from left to right. We, as I mentioned, have an exhibition um, that focuses on photographs in our collection representing both sides of the US-Mexico border. And what has been <clears throat> really special for me about this project is to see how it has evolved from a class that was offered last spring by a postdoctoral fellow, Professor Rosalia Romero, who then worked with three of the students um, who were in her class. They worked together over the summer to develop um, this exhibition. And it includes things like um, a group of uh, five photographs representing Chavez Ravine before the construction for Dodger Stadium took place, hmm. um, as well as photographs made in Mexico by um, US American artists, and um, also some um, contemporary photographs by an artist named Cristina Fernandez, um, including one new acquisition that we're very excited to celebrate and um, present for the first time when we open. So that exhibition is still still finalizing the title, so I can't share the title yet. Um, then we also have an exhibition that's very student-driven, and it does have a title. It's called Art Object Specimen, and it includes objects from our Native American collection. It also includes some of the Chinese snuff bottles that I mentioned. It also includes specimens from the college's geology department. Wow. Um, so when I was researching our history, the history of um, art collections at Pomona, we learned that the first things Pomona College started collecting were actually natural history materials, um, including you know fossils, uh, geological specimens, bones, so the college's first museum was really a natural history museum and we kind of evolved from there. And so our students were very interested 
in thinking about, you know, where, where do we draw these designations? You know, what, when does something, you know, become art per se, a capital A art? Sure. Um, and what are the expectations that we all bring into an art museum space and how um, can we, and I should say they, this is a, a student generated project, you know, how can our students kind of provoke us to question our own assumptions um, that we may attach to things that we see in um, places called art museums. So that has been a lot of fun to work on with them. And then we will also show just highlights from our permanent collection. Um, one of the things we're so delighted about with our new space is the opportunity to show so much more of our permanent collection. Um, of course, in the intimate space of one of these study rooms or classrooms, um, but also just to have space in our galleries to have a kind of regular presence for the permanent collection, which I think will be possibly a true revelation for people, even some people who've worked at Pomona for many years, just haven't had the chance to get to know objects in our permanent collection, such as um, this really marvelous still life painting by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. So major German expressionist artist, um, you know, wonderful and somewhat unusual example of his painting. And this is just one example of um, I think some of the really, you know, compelling and impressive works that we simply have not had the gallery space to show. So sure. we will have effectively a kind of highlights of the permanent collection exhibition that we hope will also um, indicate a little bit of, of the history of how all of these objects came to be in our care. And that's the name of the show, In Our Care. Awesome. Brian so, mentioned uh, he he was loving he loves the picture of uh, Chavez Ravine. Oh yeah, these are beautiful photographs. I must say, really really beautiful photographs. Um, and you know, just for me personally, working with students and faculty, um, preparing these projects has given me a chance to study our collection just a little bit at a time. Yeah. And you know, photography is certainly one of the strengths of our collection. Sure. Um, very cool. So I think those are all. I'm so glad everyone likes seeing <laughs> art. That's what that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but I know Justine mentioned this. We, you know, for the time being, um, like all of you, you know, we exist sort of in the in the digital world, mm -hmm. and um, we have been challenged. I think just like everyone else to really pivot and find ways to embrace new ways of communicating and sharing our work until yeah. we arrive at a time when we can all be together again, which I eagerly await. But this summer, um, a few of us, and most recently I have had the, the profound pleasure of working with the student, Hannah Avalos, who is our podcast producer. Nice. Um, and so just today we launched our first episode of our podcast, our new brand new podcast called Inside the Benton. Okay. And we we're already working on season two. So this is we're not <laughs> this is not a one off thing. We're we're in it to win it. I'm a huge podcast fan. So I have been getting a lot of joy um, kind of, you know, just talking about how we've made this transition and how we're adjusting um to the idea of museum work in the time of a global pandemic um how you know this experience may change our whole philosophy in terms of what an art museum should be and how it can serve its communities and i like to say communities because i think college art museums especially you know really engage kind of concentric circles of communities mm -hmm. and um, my hope for us is that we'll um, you know really be able to be accessible to more and more people and engage ever broader communities and so I, I'm hopeful that this um, moment where we've really had to learn how to communicate more digitally um, and remotely will serve us in the long term um, to make all of our programs, 
you know, more discoverable and more accessible and to let more people know what we're doing and to let everyone know that, you know, our museum is free. We um, do not charge admission. And that's something that I think we're all really proud of. And, and um, going forward, I think I, I'm hopeful that more and more museums will um, perhaps consider revising their admission policies to um, fall in line with all of us college art museums who you know, are here to provide a public service and to hold these collections really in, in a public trust. So we'd love for you to listen to our podcast and sign up for our emails, um, follow us on our social media. Justine is so good at sharing those details. And of course, we're here to take any other questions or look at, look at some of these pictures, but I can also stop sharing that if you think I should do that. But where, where do we go from here? Uh, well, if, no, if, if you want to leave it on the screen for a little bit yeah. so people can get the information, make sure okay. you check out the hashtag, the website. Uh, we do have a few questions I haven't forgotten about you guys. I know I skipped over a couple, but I think I think we're getting used to how I moderate and I apologize. I should have said I apologize in advance, but I didn't forget. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that we were keeping on uh, topic, basically. So one question um, going back a little bit. Uh, when uh, when do you plan on being totally open, which, I mean, it's kind of hard to say, but um, and then uh, will you be oh, do you plan on being open on the weekends? So we will be open as soon as we are fully installed and as soon as Pomona College opens its campus, first of all, to students right. and then um, to a broader public. So. We, you know, we're just operating under a kind of as soon as possible um, sure. mentality. And I, I wish I knew what the future will hold in terms of health policy. But we are um, we're just getting ready to open as soon as as we possibly can. And sure. I think um knowing what the academic calendar is that won't be before you know january of 2021 would be right. the earliest right the the original i think i saw i was uh, reading the original uh planned opening was in september i think was right that... we, had, we had hoped that this fall would be you know our launch date effectively yeah, yeah. and um and so we're we're just kind of holding tight for a little while but yes we are um, our standard hours historically have been 12 to 5, Tuesday through Sunday, and then um, until 10 p.m. on Thursdays for our Art After Hours program. Okay, good deal. And let's see, next question. Uh, when you open, I know you mentioned um, using the classrooms like this, but are you planning on using a reservation system when you open? So to the general public, not just in mm -hmm. the classrooms. Yes, when we, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were imagining we would be opening this fall and we were looking into a timed reservation system, even though that we're, we're free. Um, I think, you know, just as someone who is a big um, devotee of museums, um, you know, I just imagine I myself would feel more comfortable if I knew that, um, you know, there would be a limit to the number of people in the space at any one time. So that has been um, our plan is to implement a reservation system and um, also, you know, accommodate people who want to walk in, but we would be definitely monitoring um, a maximum capacity and we've already calculated what um, that should be in, in the current um, under current health policy. Right. Okay. And Alexandra was wondering about the difference between modern and contemporary art. Well, you know, the the farther we go in into time, the more contemporary art is becoming a, a bigger and bigger category. So when I was in college, contemporary art was basically considered post-war. So things produced after 1945. 
that as we get further into the 21st century, that um, designation makes less sense. So what we've seen is that um, these kind of smaller designations, you know, within that within that broader chronological rubric, have emerged. So people talk about, you know, minimalism, or refer to the light and space movement. Um, and I think that will that will just continue until we kind of come up with with some more names. But um, you know, a kind of the shorthand is you know before and after World War II. Um, but that's the the farther into the twenty first century we go, the less that that's um, really suitable. Sure, sure. And how often do you plan on switching ex exhibitions, if you will? Mm -hmm. So we will definitely change um, the exhibitions that I just mentioned are scheduled to run through the end of May 2021. And then we will start a kind of staggered um, rotation of exhibitions after that. So we um, it, it just depends how much space we allocate to an exhibition. Right. So, um, you know, there could be a project that takes our entire space. Um, but generally speaking, we would be aiming for a three to four month um, time window and we'll start staggering the opening and closing dates instead of, you know, what we have to do now is install the whole museum um, for one um one simultaneous opening, um, but then we'll start staggering when they close and when the next one's open um, like that. So we plan to change each space at least twice a year. Sure, sure. And let's see. Alexandra's going to check out the next podcast. Okay. <laughs> And let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, one, one question you may not you may not be uh, in in charge of, but when you begin to offer on campus classes, will the public be able to audit these classes, sit in, and kind of I imagine and uh, kind of partake. Right. So, yeah, historically, there has been an audit program at the college. It has a special name that I haven't quite internalized yet. And um, historically, that's just been up to the individual professor to decide whether um, his, her or their class would be, you know, designated as a class that is open to auditors. So I have every reason to believe that that policy will go back into place as we return to more, you know, traditional in-person classroom teaching. Sure, sure. And I know, Justine, you have been on top of the questions. I just want to make sure they're on the record because the live the live chat's going to disappear. So I just want to make sure they're there. But Justine's been on top of all the questions in here. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, I think you've been great. I think the presentation was wonderful. I thank you very much for taking the time to share with us what's going on at the museum. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, I, I know, uh, actually, let me, I know, Justine, you sent me, did you, that probably. Well, Matt, we might, we might have a question. I wonder oh, if anyone, anyone who's still on the call wants to give um, their, you know, just a, a quick idea of, you know, what, what is your favorite type of museum experience and, um, you know, how can the Benton meet your needs in terms of your idea of what in, an art museum of our type can offer? Absolutely. Uh, if let's for now for me, I, I, I have a uh, I have a lot to learn about art museums. I don't know. I don't know if I'm the person per se to ask. You're precisely the person. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, I wouldn't know where to begin. I uh, I think. Well, what's the last museum you went to, Matt? I'm sorry. What is the last art museum you Ooh, went to? Or oh uh, man, it would have been. Would have I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but no, I guess I. It it would it probably would have been the Getty, um, with my okay. family. And what brought you there that day? Um. <laughs> uh at, well at the time she's not anymore but at the time my girlfriend uh <laughs> okay. 
Um, that so was that was. was so it was kind of a date. It, it was, was a date. It was it absolutely. Was a place to go on a date. Yes. We can do that for you. Right. And and I know my wife, my wife now, although not my girlfriend at the time, so maybe we should. Uh, but okay. my now wife would love uh, to come. And I think this is definitely right up her alley. Uh, and we haven't been. So I think I'd definitely come and, and check out what's going on. I know I already just saw the pictures. And uh, while I'm not necessarily somebody that would consider myself uh, knowledgeable on art in any way, uh, I definitely saw. Uh, I, I, I'm one of the people that when you point it out, I can see it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I, I can like, oh, I, I, but if it left to my own devices, I really, I, I know that I like that, but I don't know why I may not be able do to you articulate like reading why. reading a lot of labels about stuff or do you like it better when someone is there to kind of tell you something in person? Um, I think an audio guide. You want to do self, like a self tour. I think I think it depends, but I, I would say that I'm probably more of a self self tour mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. Um, not really sure. I think I think there's benefits to both, and I could see myself obviously I think uh, benefiting from both. Where I may uh, somebody that's there to speak to me on something may point something out to me that ha- would not have caught my attention any other way. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think that left to my own devices, um, you know, I yeah, I would I would probably be more of a self guide myself. Uh-huh. Just kind Plus of. Plus, if you're on a date, you probably don't want that third wheel coming right? in, exactly. telling you what to look. That's kind of cramping your style. Exactly. So you might be the person because we were thinking about developing an app where you could I'm... get the information for yourself. Sure. And then you could be. The expert basically i think an app would be cool i think uh, i think that that feeds into and now this is obviously i'm kind of tech biased uh to a certain extent so apps de- definitely are a language that i do speak um but yeah i think that i i am i'm definitely the kind of person that would dive a little deeper um with an app something okay. and, and maybe learn more than i would have uh left left to my own devices mm-hmm Okay, good to know. Well, anyone else out there who wants to we share have, their... Uh, Alexandra oh, said she likes tours, definitely. Tours. Uh, audio tours, something to consider. I think an app would be kind of an audio tour plus. Uh, right, you can kinda... add that. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So um, I wanted to answer um, Alexandra's question about the audio tours. Yes. Um, in the past, we haven't implemented something like that, but it is something that we are thinking about implementing for the future. But more importantly, wanted to share that we have um, programs that connect to the exhibition so that it gives opportunities for our audiences to go deeper into the artwork, to the artists, to why we're presenting that at that time. And so sometimes, you know, audio tours are good, of course, um, to have at your disposal, but we have live presentations, Mm -hmm. live um, programs that are open to the public, to the general public for free, to um, just go deeper into what we offer at the museum as well. Sure, sure. And I'm not sure. That's how you learn about those events, which I put the link in the chat. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, Christine, how do you learn about the events? (laughs) (laughs) That's perfect. No, that's wonderful. And you know, and something else you could do with an app, I imagine, and I imagine there are other places that are doing something like this, but I think that opens you up also to be able to do virtual tours, uh, mm-hmm. things that you can do, um, uh, uh, like update as, as the exhibition changes. Mm-hmm. And, and it can be more of a, an interactive thing too, especially like you were mentioning, uh, the philosophy changing, given uh, we're now in the, 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 we will be in the world, the post COVID world at that time we're not quite there yet but um being being um able to see things not necessarily uh you don't want people not to come to the museum obviously um but uh, being able to go on a virtual tour to learn more or maybe go and see and uh, like you were mentioning with crowds for example maybe i couldn't spend as much time as i wanted to but i can go back and feel Mm -hmm. like i i'm back and and fill in those gaps I could see that being a really great resource. Matt, if we do this app, we are expecting you to come once a week. I, I will be there. <laughs> I will absolutely, and I will bring my wife, and it'll be a date. We'll, it'll be, it'll happen. Yeah, in studies, they say that on average, people look at artwork for an average of six seconds, and mm-hmm. that's it. Wow. Uh, and 
the way that our museum is set up, you know, being so accessible in terms of um, being free to the public, but our hours, we try to make the hours pretty broad. Um, sure that we do welcome and encourage repeat visits because your experience in contemporary art a lot of times is very um, subjective or can be very um, contextual, not just um, to the artwork, but like what you're going through and how you're experiencing it. And so we always encourage people not just to come to see the show and then that's it, but right. like really come and see the works and um, discover all of the different programs that's affiliated with it. But another thing that I wanted to present to you all is that we do have a series of publications that accompany our exhibitions. And for our upcoming two exhibitions with artist Alison Saar and Alia Ali, we will have um, a catalog that's available for purchase uh, starting in September, October. And um, yeah, Very and to cool. find out about it. <laughs> 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 very <in> cool <laughs> uh so some more feedback somebody uh, said i like to view art with plenty of space around it like no overcrowding at the pieces um let's see brian likes uh art through photos going back to the 1800s uh, alexandra has a question do you both reflect on art a lot i would imagine i would imagine you'd have to <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of what you do <laughs> I have Alexandra. I can't wait to meet you, Alexandra, by the way. I love it. You're so, so many great comments and questions. I um, thank goodness for my mental health that I have been able to access our own collection this mm. time since March because, I mean, I'm a true museum junkie. I just, it's been really hard for me to not go into other museums. I actually did get um, a sneak peek. I was transacting a little bit of business with my friend, uh, Malcolm Warner, who's the director of the Laguna Art Museum. And he let me in, he turned on the lights for me, even though they are closed now. So I got to visit one museum, one other museum <laughs> since March 9th. But I am an absolute museum junkie, art junkie. Um, yeah, there's a great, um, natural history, the sort of grand, great, great grandfather of art history was a Roman historian named Pliny the Elder. And he mm -hmm. um, talked about the visual arts and quoted an, an ancient Greek artist named Apelles who said, no day without a line. If you want to be an excellent artist, you have to draw every day, at least try to draw a straight line every day. And I guess for me, that's sort of like no day without an art object. Mm -hmm. So it's an emphatic yes in all capitals for me. <laughs> Very good. I don't see any other questions. Justine, how about you? Um, I would say definitely yes. And uh, both professionally and personally, that's what I um, studied. I got my MFA in uh, photography, fine art photography. I saw, that, media. I saw that in chat. Yeah. And so the other thing, too, is being a parent. I have two young ones, as you saw, you know, running <laughs> behind me. Um, and so you reflect about art in different ways as well, just in sure. terms of, you know, how are you creating significance for your for the next generation and relating to, with them through art and the art that's going on right now and how they help you to talk to them about what's going on. Sure. See, and that is one thing that I do know going back to the stadium, the pre-Dodger Stadium photo. I know I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not what I would consider uh, an artist or anything, but I, knowing a little bit about history and a lot about, well, a lot about history and a little about photography, I, I think that it's interesting, too, um, that a lot of times you don't realize that you're making art at the time. At the time, you're just taking a photo especially now with phones and cameras being more accessible, pictures are all over the place, you don't necessarily realize that, hey, that, that picture that you took now is in like a, a famous spot that you can't recreate that picture at all ever again. And so now all of a sudden, while maybe you were just at the time taking a photo, obviously at that time is a little more complicated than it is now, but still, that that's that the nature of art in particular photography you don't even know the uh historical significance of of what you're making necessarily right now 
uh, which I think speaks to the importance of still getting out there and, and, and creating. Nat, we're just going to recruit you to work at the museum with us. Well, you know, hey, if you need anybody, I do have free time. I just, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows what the future brings, like you said. Originally, I was a business major, so I don't I don't know. <laughs> Man of many talents. It sounds yeah, like. well, like we were talking about earlier, in this day and age, you kind of have to know a little about a lot. So um let's see yeah great addition absolutely great addition thank you for this is from alexandra thank you too so much for taking the time out of your evening to share and talk about uh talk with the music uh, alexandra you're taking my job like i just i know yeah. i just got recruited but i still have a job to do here so she can't wait to visit with her family and friends uh no word on if that'll be a date or not i don't i mean I, no, no pressure i'm just saying um yeah, great addition to Claremont. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much. Is there anything else that we thank didn't you. cover you feel like um, our viewers should know or uh, that you'd like to let I think us we, know? I think we did a lot. I think you just need to have us back when we're you know ready to open our doors and we'll, we'll run down all of the programs that we're lining up and all of our activities and community offerings. So thank you so much for having us. We are you know, really excited about this big transition for our museum and really, as we said, hoping to find more and new ways to contribute to the Claremont community and inland cities. So. Absolutely. Wonderful. What do you think would be the best way we could, we as, as the community around Claremont could help the museum right now? That's interesting. Well, um, we're, we'd never say no to, you know, cash donations. Um, <laughs> that, that's always helpful. Um, but I think, yeah, spreading the word, following us, you know, just raising our visibility. We, you know, when you change your name, it takes a while for people to kind of, you know, internalize what the new name is and, and, um, so I think, yeah, just spreading the good word and helping us, um, you know, get people excited for, you know, that fateful day. We hope not too far in the future when we'll all be together in an art gallery right. here in Claremont. Right. Very good. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so I think I will go ahead and end the stream here again thank you very much for presenting to us it was a great wealth of information and i feel like i learn a lot about the community i live in the community i don't know anything about i, I feel like that happens a little too often uh, i know it's not a, a good time right now but i feel like i need to get out more yeah. um so so uh with that let's see i will uh yeah i think we'll we'll see you guys uh, all next time thanks for watching and you, uh, definitely check out the podcast and follow the Benton uh, Museum of Art at Pomona College on social media. And uh, we'll go ahead and have description or we'll have uh, links put in the description of this video once I get it posted later tonight. Very good. Thank you again, Victoria and Justine. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good